Let's take a third look at what a patient is. As you recall from the last lecture, we evolved in Africa and then spread out across the planet. And as we spread out, we diverged genetically in many different directions. That has consequences for our ability to resist infectious disease, for our susceptibility to degenerative disease, and in general, uh, for the fact that each patient then becomes an individual with respect to these issues. In order to look at this in the modern genetic context, we need to have a little background on genome-wide association studies. So this is uh, a way of analyzing genetic data where you have signposts across the genome. So they might be in regions that contain, say, five to 100 genes or something like that. And you can recognize which variant a patient has depending upon a single nucleotide polymorphism. They are used to find genetic effects for common chronic and late onset diseases. And they are pretty effective where the relative risk is a bit lower and where polygenic effects are common. So these are not classical Mendelian genetic diseases of large effect. This is an attempt to find genetic effects on all sorts of other diseases. For example, the relative risk for a first-degree relative for 28 kinds of cancer. That means that if mom or dad had cancer, how probable is it that you will have cancer? That's about 2.2. In other words, if your parent, one of your parents had cancer, then you are 2.2 times more likely to have cancer than a person just sampled at random from the population. And for coronary artery disease, uh, if your brother has it, then you are about three times as likely to have it as some random person selected from the population. So thinking about risk is tricky. Let's suppose that the absolute risk is 1 in 100 and that relationship can increases that 2.2 times. Then, then, the, then the adjusted absolute risk or relative risk is 2.2. So here the risk is 1%, here it's 2.2%. So saying it that way makes it sound a bit different uh, from talking about, say, you're 2.2 times as likely. That makes it sound worse. So uh, genome-wide association studies are now called GWAS, just as a way of talking about it in a more compressed format. And they work if the important alleles, the genetic variants, are present in multiple individuals, so they have to, you have to have a sample where you run into them several times. They don't always have to be completely expressed. The penetrance can be as low as 10 percent. And uh, relative risk can be as low as 1.1. So the effect of that gene on increasing the risk of a disease can be as little as a 10 percent effect. So that generated, after the sequencing of the human genome, that generated a project where people tried to find markers all over the genome and associate them with diseases. It was called the HapMap, for haplotype map. A haplotype would be a chromosome that had a particular set of markers on it as distinguished from another haplotype that had a different set of markers on it. The first really major paper that was done was one run by the Wellcome Trust. It came out in 2007, and they looked at seven diseases, they looked at 14,000 cases, and they had 3,000 shared controls, okay? So in all, there were 14,000 people who had one or more of these seven diseases, and there were 3,000 people who didn't have them. They looked at their genomes, they looked at which genetic variants they had across their whole genome. There were 24 signals of an association between genetic variation and disease. And they demanded that this be at a probability smaller than 5 times 10 to the minus 7th. That's because they're looking at so many different comparisons. There is some possibility that if you look at a million comparisons, some will be significant just at random. So this corrects for that. They found one for bipolar, one for coronary heart disease, nine for Crohn's disease, that's an inflammatory bowel syndrome, three for rheumatoid arthritis, seven for type 1 diabetes, and three for type 2 diabetes. So these were 
uh, discoveries of new genetic effects on the risk of these diseases. And some of these uh, effects are increasing the risk of more than one disease. And most of these effects are pretty modest. The effect sizes are small. So here are the diseases, bipolar, coronary, Crohn's, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So that's the meaning of these different panels. What you see here are the human chromosomes laid out end to end, chromosome 1, 2, 3, up to the X chromosome. So this is the whole human genome. And this axis over here is the probability that a particular genetic variant has a significant impact on the disease. And so as you walk across this, you see some things that stand out, okay? Here, for coronary artery disease, we see, oh my goodness, there is a gene there which is on chromosome 9, and it's having an effect on the risk of heart disease, which is significant at the level of 10 to the minus 15th, okay? So this is a minus log scale for base 10. That would be 1, 10 to the 0, and 15 is 10 to the minus 15th probability. So you look at that and you say, my goodness, here is some genetic variation for uh, a, a variety of important uh, degenerative diseases and mental diseases. However, in general, this has been done a lot. And what we find is that we have detected very many new diseases, many new genetic effects on diseases, and the effects that they're having are fairly small. So why isn't this working? We know that we have about 2,900 genetic disorders that had already been traced to specific genetic defects. We have another 3,700 disorders that show evidence of Mendelian in inheritance but haven't been precisely located. And you can go to this website and see the list. And here are some reasons. One is that the genetic variation that we're looking at in these genome-wide association studies deals with common variants. And they almost never have very large effects. So they have relative risks of about 1.2 to 1.5. And they thus explain very little of the variance in disease in the population. They're explaining 1 to 2% of the variation in how people uh, encounter these diseases. Some of the missing causes might be found in rare alleles of large effect. There are current attempts to do this by sequencing entire genomes rather than looking at single nucleotide polymorphism. Also, the unexplained genetic causation might be due to low penetrance alleles. So these are cases where the genetic variation is there, but the developmental system is not letting it be completely expressed. Much of the genetic causation might be missed because it's epistatic. That means that, yes, this uh, particular variant has an effect, but only in combination with some other variant. And so you then have to start trying to detect combinations rather than just single gene variation. And the genetic effects are probably masked by environmental effects. So this is kind of interesting. This means that the Human Genome, Genome Project, which was supposed to give us the book of life and was supposed to tell us so much about susceptibility to disease, turned out to be disappointing. That doesn't mean it was a bad idea. It gave us a lot of useful information it gave us a tremendous number of useful tools. But one of the arguments that sold the project 15 or 20 years ago uh, turned out to be wrong. Let's take an example where we can see this issue in a little more detail. And we'll just take human height. It's, uh, it's not a disease, but it's a case where we can study the genetic substrate of a trait in great detail. So three genome-wide association studies have been done looking for genetic determinants of human height. Now, human height has a heritability that's consistently estimated at about 80%. What that means is that about 80% of the variation in children can be explained by the height of their parents. It's not looking directly at the DNA. It's inferring genetic effect from relatives. 
the total sample size for these three genome-wide association studies was about 85,000 people. So it's a pretty powerful study. They found 52 chromosomal regions that influence height. 40 of them were previously unknown, so that sounds good. But the studies only explained 2.9%, 2%, and 3.7% of the variation in body height versus 80% that's thought to have genetic, genetic determinants. The difference between the number 80 and the number 3 is pretty big. That re represents our ignorance of the genetic determination of body height. It, about 77% of the stuff that's going on here is not yet identified. So, that means that height is either influenced by almost the entire genome or that there are interactions among genes during development that are very important, or both. If that is the kind of pattern that is determining susceptibility to degenerative disease, then we are into a very complex problem of inference and into a complex problem of thinking about causality. It appears that complex common diseases have this pattern. So, an intermediate summary on genome-wide association studies. The sequencing of the human genome made possible the development of these studies. There have been a few genetic variants, alleles, that have been identified that have significant impact on some important common diseases, but their effect sizes are small. They aren't explaining too much of the variation. Their causal links to the diseases are obscure, and that means that the promise of individual medicine based on, say, gene ship information is not yet realized. We have to scale back our expectations of the Human Genome Project. It gave us a lot, but it certainly didn't give it everything that was hoped for. Now, let's look a little more in detail at some individual diseases where prior information before GWAS had given us some insight into genetic effects. The first are HLA genes, those are major histocompatibility complex genes in humans that are associated with resistance to tuberculosis, AIDS, malaria, hepatitis B, typhoid fever, and leprosy. And what we find are particular alleles in the MHC complex that are providing resistance or causing susceptibility to each of these diseases. There are also some genes that are not in the major histocompatibility complex, non-HLA genes, that are associated with resistance to tuberculosis, AIDS, malaria, and leprosy. And those are genes that have to do with uh, blood cells, thalassemias, and sickle cells, and things like that, that help to resist malaria, and so forth. Now, the interesting thing about this is there aren't many such associations. But they certainly do pick out a set of diseases that appear to have been associated with humans for a long time and that have helped to shape our genome. If we look at global variation and susceptibility to two diseases, type 2 diabetes and biliary liver cirrhosis, we find interesting contrast in the patterns. For type 2 diabetes, there's a very clear pattern. The risk is much lower in East Asia than it is in West and South Asia, Europe, or Africa. So this is Africa, this is South Asia, this is East Asia. If we look, so in, in this case, it looks like, oh, we came out of Africa, and the risk that we have of type 2 diabetes got lower and lower and lower as we moved out across the planet. But for biliary liver cirrhosis, it's really quite a mixed bag. If you just look in East Asia, there are some populations that have very low risk, others that have very high risk. It's mixed in Africa, it's mixed in Europe, and so forth. So these things appear to evolve separately with different patterns over the last 100,000 years. Now let's take a look at one particular case, that's the ABO blood group polymorphism, which is so important to understanding uh, blood transfusion 
So these letters are referring to proteins that are produced on the surface of red blood cells, and they act as antigens. They elicit immune responses if they are not identified as self. So if you get the wrong kind of uh, transplant, then your immune system thinks it's being invaded by a pathogen, and it will attack those cells, and it will cause a real problem. So these are the blood types, A, B, O, and A, B. And these are the antigens that are being presented on those blood types and the antibodies that they elicit. And if the parent has this blood type, so this could be the mother here and this could be the father here, here are the possible offspring, okay? So either an A or O donor can, can give to an A type, a B or o, or o donor can give to a B, an AB can get blood from AB, AB, or O, but O can only receive blood from O. That's the result of all that information. Interestingly, some people have two different blood types. They're chimeric, and they're chimeric because they shared blood with a non-identical twin before birth. There are about 8% non-identical twins have chimeric blood. Ultrasound allows us to examine the dynamics of pregnancy, and it suggests that about 70% of pregnancies that start as twins end as singletons. In other words, there are some babies who were born who had a twin brother or sister that they never knew they had. It, was, it started to develop, but then it died and it was absorbed before the mother or the doctor knew about it. That means some people with chimeric blood didn't know they started as a twin until they learned that, when they discover that they have chimeric blood. And that can be seen from the ABO polymorphism. ABO actually mediates disease resistance. So A types are more susceptible and O types are more resistant to malaria, Plasmodium falciparum, which is the really pathogenic, the more virulent malaria. O is more, more susceptible, and B is more resistant to Norwalk virus, which causes infant diarrhea, an important cause of mortality in developing countries. O and A are more susceptible to Helicobacter pylori, which adheres to gastric epithelial cells and causes stomach ulcers, and it, the inflammation also then leads on to stomach cancer. And it uses blood group antigens associated with O to do that. Blood group O is more isolated and isolate, more common in isolated populations. For example, it's pretty frequent in Central and South, South American Indians. And combinations of ABO also cause variation in susceptibility to syphilis, cholera, and plague. Now, mutations can cause reduced secretion of ABO into saliva. And if you are a non-secretor, then you're at higher risk of various infectious diseases. This is kind of a front line of defense in our mouth against getting these pathogens. So people who don't secrete these antigens into their saliva are at increased risk of meningitis. But the people who do secrete it are at higher risk of having uh, a cough or a cold or something like that, or bronchitis. So you'll see there's a trade-off here. What about individual medicine? Okay, there's all this genetic variation out there. We have to, at some level, we have to look at patients as individuals sampled from a population that has variation in it. There's individual variation in genes that affect drug metabolism, and it has important effects on treatment uh, efficacy. You often then need to determine how an individual is going to react. And the geographic evidence suggests that the evolutionary process that produced this kind of variation evolved through both natural selection and drift. And the most immediate benefit of individualized medicine might be in cancer treatment. That means that we might design cancer treatments that will be effective against the particular cancer in this particular individual. When we think about trying to do that, it sounds very costly, but this is the cost per genome now. So the, the white line is Moore's Law. That is the rate at which computer chips get cheaper, okay? And the green line is the rate at which sequencing an entire human genome gets cheaper. And you can see that when the Human Genome Project started out, it cost $100 million for one genome. 
The cost in 2013 is $1,000, and it's likely to go down to $100 within a few years. So we may soon have access to the entire genome of everyone on the planet. So as we spread out across the planet, we differentiated genetically, and those genetic differences have consequences. Among them, there's genetic variation for disease resistance, and that's clearly identified for malaria, leprosy, HIV, typhoid fever, and tuberculosis. Variation in the ABO blood group is also related to syphilis, cholera, plague, and helicobacter susceptibility. These patterns could have been produced by a loss of resistance as well as by its acquisition. So both kinds of things could be going on. There could be some selection for acquiring resistance and there should, could be some drift that causes resistance to be lost. Genetic variation for susceptibility has been identified for 11 diseases, including, importantly, type 2 diabetes, biliary liver cirrhosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and pancreatic cancer. So not everyone is equivalent in the risk that they have of getting these diseases. If we want to treat people properly for these sorts of issues, we need pretty precise genetic information on them. And we can currently get an entire genome for about $1,000. So this is certainly going to be coming.